Yeah. So uh, we are very happy to welcome Ashutosh Kotwal to give the 11th OSMO lecture on particle physics, what we know and what we do not know. Ashutosh is presently the Fritz London Professor of Physics at Duke University. His research interests are in experimental particle physics related to W bosons and the Higgs boson and in searches for new particles and forces. Ashutosh was born and brought up in India where he obtained his early education. He started his higher studies at the University of Pennsylvania in 1983 where he received dual degrees in electrical engineering from the Moore School and in economics with a finance major from the Wharton School. He received his PhD in physics from Harvard University in 1995. After conducting postdoctoral research at Columbia University, Ashutosh joined Duke as a professor in 1999, where he has also served as the director of particle physics. Additionally, he was in charge of a Higgs boson search team as part of the ATLAS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. He was part of the CERN team that announced the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, and he conducts experiments at the LHC as well as at Fermilab in Chicago. In addition to his research, he presently coordinates US physicists in the global effort to build a new collider with seven times higher energy than the LHC and has collaborated with the Chinese and European groups in this effort. Recently, Ashutosh led a major world effort to measure the mass of the W boson using data from CDF and D0 experiments at Fermilab. Four million W boson events were analyzed to measure its mass to an accuracy of 0.01%. The measured mass value was published in Science and is in significant tension with the value expected from the standard model of particle physics and may imply the existence of a new principle of physics. Ashutosh is a fellow of the American Physical Society and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was a recipient of the Outstanding Junior Investigator Award from the US Department of Energy and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship. He has also received the Dean's Leadership Award from Duke University. With this, I now hand over the proceedings to Ashutosh to give us his perspective on the current status of particle physics. Over to you. Thank you so much, Tejinder. I was hoping you would stop earlier. <laughs> I've never had such a long introduction. Uh, very good. So, Thank you all again uh, for attending and uh, for inviting me for what has been extremely educational for me. And I was mentioning to both uh, Michael and Tejinder a little earlier. Certainly for me growing up with just hearing basically mo either model building or string theory for a long, long, long time, it is extremely refreshing to see another idea, at least for me, new. I mean, maybe it's not so new, but for me, it's very new. So you know, I've been listening to as many lectures as I can, and it's been uh, really, I mean, I'm talking to some of my friends about some of these things, all experimentalists, so what do we know? But just the possibilities sort of seem exciting. So, you know, if we can come out with, what shall I say, experimental things we can actually pursue, uh, I think that would be amazing. So with that, this topic, of course, is, uh, what shall I say, um, too ambitious, for an hour or something like this. I mean, it's many, many, many brilliant things, experimental and theoretical things built into this model, which over a hundred years has done so amazing things. So what do we know and what do we not know? I'll do my best to sort of capture a few things the way I understand them. Um, let's move on. So lately, lately, I would say, this realization has, of course, been recognized, as you see, in a couple of Nobel Prizes, that in addition to the you know, fermion content and the gauge principle, this dynamical sort of symmetry breaking of gauge symmetry has done some very important things in the model. It's been thought about for 50 years, and eventually the experiments have caught up. And so I would say it's, it's a new era or, or a new stage where the standard model has reached, where we are not 
just checking the fermionic properties and the gauge symmetry principle properties, but all the stuff that now comes along with the dynamical symmetry breaking of gauge symmetry. This is now the next big thing. So the first few questions have to do with that. I would say what people are thinking, what's this, this unusual vacuum? I mean, there is the QCD vacuum, but this one is even the higher energy and does even more interesting things in some sense. Um, what kind of thing is out there, this Higgs condensate that happens to have carry a gauge charge or a couple of gauge charges actually. And that leads to many other things going on. And so I guess my point is going to be soon enough that compared to what preceded this thing in the standard model, which seemed much more axiomatic and like first principles math and so on, the way the symmetry breaking is occurring in some sense is much cruder. The implementation in the standard model is very clever. The phenomena it induces is quite clever, but the way it does it, it does it with a, with a polynomial potential. You know, and I always thought, when you start learning physics, you get potential energy and kinetic energy, but soon enough, the gauge principle, gauge boson exchange and so on, has explained all interactions completely dynamically. And so there's no potential energy and so on anymore, right? So all that is long gone. And yet with the Higgs, we are back to that old idea. Some V as a function of the scalar field is just stuck in there and you give it a particular shape and it does this magic. So maybe, maybe that aspect, tells you there's much more going on there as well. So that's that. Dark matter is a big mystery. I'll have a little bit to say about it. It is now well known given the Higgs mass and so forth that the standard model for a few reasons, the Sakharov conditions I'll mention, are one of them is available, the other one is barely, and the third one is not at all. So you can't quite get the matter antimatter symmetry if after the Big Bang, it was just standard model and nothing else. Then, then you would get much more symmetric universe between matter and antimatter. So there are experiments. The AMS experiment is up there looking for antimatter in space. Uh, that's the other approach that there is antimatter out there, equal amounts, but it looks like there isn't reason for the asymmetry. Then neutrinos, the way I was taught the standard model, they looked massless, looked completely left-handed. So you know, you put massless neutrinos in and make, you know, there's, there's no right-handed sector for the neutrinos. And now that we've got mixing and uh, people are looking for the absolute mass, is there, is it just a simple higgs Yukawa? But that seems much more awkward. I mean, it's already awkward for the fermions as the mass ratios are pretty awkward. If you stick in the neutrino mass ratios, then it becomes even more awkward. So you might say nature has something smarter at stake than just a huge range of Yukawa couplings. It seems quite awkward to engineer. Okay. Dark energy, I'll say with nothing about. And then this question is on your minds at the very bottom. It's all on our minds too, but for the large part, the experimental side doesn't quite know how to get to gravity from the energies that we are at. So unless somehow that gravitational scale is brought down to an energy we can reach, I'm not quite sure what to do with gravity. The, the experiment is mostly. Okay, so where's the standard model now? I guess the fact that they are, you know, you take the Lorentz group and it breaks up into SE2 cross SE2 left and right, and the fermions and the fundamental representation of both of these, and it all is very beautiful math. When I look at it, I say, wow, this is just, automatic and amazing. It couldn't be simpler than this and this, this is really magic. So all of that is fantastic. But as you all know, the mass structure is quite awkward. So the Higgs is for it. You just stick some random coupling to the Higgs and then it's tuned, or tuned until you get the right answer and it seems to work. It's amazing it seems to work in some sense. I'll show you a plot. Then there are three generations, so I heard for one of you, three generations might actually be understandable from the Octonian perspective. But from the, just the model building perspective, why would you stop here? But I don't think anybody knows why you would stop here. 
but there are a few indications from experiment. One is that the Higgs production cross section is not supporting the existence of additional chiral fermions. There can be other vector fermions, but chiral fermions would have to have a Higgs coupling and then they would show up in the Higgs production cross section and we're not seeing that extra cross section. It's, it's consistent with the standard model. So the number of chiral generations seems to be constrained to three from a couple of ways fairly well. Um, but why stop at three? Theoretically, we don't know. So we could say we don't know that. This particular grouping, I think I know the reason. You can tell me if I've got it right. That the way you pick the quark representation and the way you pick the lepton representation, it's got some magic in there that the loop diagram might violate gauge invariance beyond tree level. Those loop diagrams exactly cancel out perfectly. So gauge invariance remains a good symmetry in with quantum corrections. And that happens because of the representations that happen to be work in the standard model. So that's a very important coincidence is the way I've been explained, uh, but maybe there's a deeper reason for that coincidence. That, that those Fermion the representations are exactly the way they ought to be. So that gauge invariance is a good symmetry and some other clever things also, but I think we're not sure. I don't know what more is reasoning behind that. So then the other grand success is this gauge invariance principle. It just keeps doing all kinds of good things, uh, makes quantum field theory all beautiful and self-consistent and has all kinds of predictions and powerful things. And so when you look at the gauge sector, uh, it's my understanding it's sort of related to the equivalence principle of gravity as well, that you can redefine coordinate systems of space-time or internal spaces and the whole thing remains invariant and that requires these additional covariant derivatives and that those things look like forces. So all of this is very little parametric stuff. There is only one gauge charge for every gauge group you stick in here. Otherwise everything else is group theory and field theory and just all beautifully axiomatic. So then when we get to the Higgs, it all becomes a little kludgy, I would say. This potential that's been put in seems to do the job quite well. Uh, but exactly what is causing this V of phi to develop this shape? Why not some other shape? Why stop at the polynomial that you stop at? Not sure there's a good reason for it. Uh, maybe more importantly, unlike everything else in the standard model, this shape of the potential is hand-picked not really of some dynamical origin. So you might say that not really how it should work. It should have a dynamical origin. So there's maybe more the understanding model that gives it a dynamical origin. Okay. So with this, I would say this is my way of looking at it. Which parts of the standard model look very axiomatic and with some deep principles embedded in there. The fermions, certainly so. The gauge bosons, certainly so. And, uh, you know, very simple things like spin half produces Fermi Dirac statistics and automatically produces the Pauli exclusion principle. And that tells you why wave functions have to get stacked up when you build an atom. And so matter looks like it has to occupy volume and so on. So all the simple things we look around and we say in high school or something, right? What is matter? What is a force? It's now suddenly all very clear from this part of the standard model what makes matter matter-like and what makes forces force-like. And then this symmetry breaking idea kicks in. And the other thing that we learn in high school, you know, just imagine there is an additive quantity called mass and it goes into F equals MA. And then with these properties, the equations all work. Now we have this other insight that the mass itself is from this perspective, sort of dynamically generated. So it's not something that just comes in from the very beginning, you make it yourself. So that's much better. Yeah. But then when you say all of that is done by this Higgs mechanism, but then where is that mechanism's real physics, the dynamical physics behind it? In the standard model, there is none. So people have thought about it, but. So when you look at this chart and you look at what parts of the standard model are 
far more elegant, which is the yellow at the top, and much more parametric, uh, which is the Higgs sector at the bottom, then it looks like just about everything in the Higgs sector is, it's very clever, but there's a whole bunch of parametric parts to it, like this CKM matrix here, which is the couplings matrix between the different fermion flavors, which you can try to diagonalize and so on. Whole bunch of numbers sure to it, but a lot of sort of randomness to it as well. Then these numbers that define um, clever for nature to be what it is, but still begs the question why. And cosmological constant, I guess you can't put it in the gauge sector, so you put it in the Higgs sector because those are the two sectors. So then that's another mysterious thing uh, you know about it. So you could say there's another aspect of it. A lot of the Higgs sector is mysterious, but it's cleverly magical. So we know something and we don't know something. So just to show you a couple of plots, the Higgs by itself now is completely well established to a very large extent. And by that, I mean 10%, sometimes 5%, but mostly 10%. Its properties do match up with whatever this aspect of the standard model tells you it should be. So once you get the parameterization in there and you start computing many other numbers, branching ratios and so on, spin, uh, parity, it all starts to line up with the way this model said it would be. So initially it was called a Higgs-like boson because you couldn't be sure, but now it's pretty much clear everybody calls it the Higgs boson. Doesn't have to mean it's the only one, but it looks quite a lot like the one we think it is. It's still not convinced most of us, it needs to be exactly that way. So like I was saying earlier, future colliders, one big push is, can we make a, an accelerator that is specially designed for making Higgs measurements in some ways much, much more precise some of them reaching 0.1% accuracy rather than few percent or 10%. So that if there was a little deviation, you know, it almost is the standard model Higgs boson, but that's not the end of the story. It could quite be that way. So we have to find out. So that's one reason to think of the next set of colliders. Here is the other plot that shows that the couplings of the Higgs to the particles we've observed so far. So the Gauge bosons, W and Z, the top quark, largest coupling there. Bottom quark, tau lepton, so these are the second generation. And one second generation lepton. The electron is going to be very hard. Uh, the coupling is too small, so we'll have to do something extremely clever if possible, we'll see. But the muon is starting to become quite well visible. So you see on the bottom plot, the simplest Higgs mechanism we have in the standard model for the fermion says the Yukawa coupling and the mass should be in exact proportion. So when you measure the decays, you're measuring the coupling. And of course, you know the masses. So is that ratio one uh, appropriately normalized? And within all those experimental error bars, they all seem like they fall on one. But large errors. So who knows? Right? If there's a 1% deviation, that could be important. But on some of, you know, we are not really near 1% yet like to get there. One more thing, why this potential traditionally has been stopped fourth power of the Higgs field? The only answer I've heard is, if you do that, then like everything else in the standard model, it remains renormalizable. So if your goal is to remain predictive at arbitrary energies, and, and that's your philosophy, then you have to truncate here. So. Okay, whoever wrote this down said, that's my philosophy and I'm going to truncate here. But if this potential itself is ad hoc, then you could take the other mindset, which is uh, if it is ad hoc, there's no a priori reason for there not to be additional you know, higher dimension terms in here. And if those higher dimension terms do in fact exist, then there is no reason for the truncation here to be predictive, I mean, it will predict, except its predictions will turn out wrong. So it's fine if you want to be predictive until you discover the prediction does not hold out true. We in fact, do see in nature a higher order term and so forth. So depending on your mindset, you can say, let's allow this. 
So you can either allow it or not. Allow it. But if there's some dynamical origin behind this potential with the numbers that show up, the mu and the lambda and whatever higher you know, dimension six operator and dimension of operator might be there. Dynamical thing, of course, has no reason to be truncating there. It will produce some low energy parameterization of its dynamics, which will have whatever terms it needs. So like a polynomial fit to some real underlying function. So this is becoming an important message from the LHC that so far it looks like the truncated thing does a good job, but means we haven't reached the precision or the energy to be sensitive to the dimension six term or dimension eight term. So let's just wait and see because you're looking under the lamppost and very close to the minimum of the Higgs potential, it looks naturally like all functions with minimal look. It looks parabolic because just a Taylor expansion will tell you it should look parabolic. But if you go far enough away, you'll start to see uh, different behavior. So this process is one of the things that is, is more and more data at the LHC. One of its motivations has always been this one, that already that polynomial predicts a certain Higgs coupling to itself. It has to because it's a nonlinear potential. But if you have more terms, then this effective nonlinear triple Higgs coupling will look like a different number. Uh, so let's go measure this coupling and see if it agrees with the truncated polynomial or a longer polynomial. And so people write papers saying, if I just put in some dynamics this way or that way, uh, then I'll see rather large deviations. There's, there's no reason uh, for it to be exactly so. So let's just try it. Okay. The other big mystery, lots of people have given talks on naturalness for a long time. It's a little less popular now because the logic of naturalness was the things, the issues with the Higgs should naturally not have to require numbers to be just so that they should be natural numbers and the quantum correction should not be big. So if any quantum correction turns out to be big, there should be some additional physics that fixes that up. And uh, that, fix, that fixing physics should be low line. Um, and so that became called the LEP paradox, the E plus E minus collider from the 1990s. Started looking more and more like there is a Higgs and nothing to fix its issues. So that was the paradox. And now it's turning into the LHC paradox, which is sort of the same statement. How does this thing balance itself so well that this one extremely efficient thing is doing all its jobs, but its own problems are not getting solved by extension. So why isn't anything else showing up beyond just the simple Higgs? So this has been thrown around for a long time that when you do the corrections to the Higgs mass, the, 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 the hoofed argument that there's no additional symmetry that protects this quantum correction from being small. And so when you do it, you automatically find a very large quantum correction. So it is renormalizable, but it means the original Lagrangian parameter has to be adjusted by some large, large thing so that the measured value and the renormalized value come out to be small. So that's why is the Higgs so light? It should not be so light. Uh, it should, the, the, the quantum evolution or renormalization should run it up to wherever the new physics scale is. And the bigger this lambda goes, one TV, two TV, 10 TV, then this thing diverges quadratically. And so that got stated over and over 10 years ago. Uh, but now I think it's been said so often people don't say it anymore, but the, the, the issue sort of remains. So this is the way I look at it. You know, if you walked around and you saw the Empire State Building standing on its base, you would say, yeah, that's a stable configuration. If somebody showed you standing it upside down, balancing on its tip, you'd say sure, somebody could hold it there and make it balance like that, but something's gonna make it fall over very soon. And so you'd be very surprised if the Empire State Building was observed to be balanced on its tip and not falling over. So this is how the Higgs is starting to look. So that's been the so-called fine tuning problem with, and as I understand it was recognized in the fifties or sixties even, where if you put in a single scalar with nothing else, 
into the query, then these things are going to pop up in the theoretical sense. So something more ought to be there. Okay. Then there is this other parameter. So as we said, every part of the Higgs sector seems to just generate more questions. That the lambda to the five-fold term, you can also make you know higher loops there. And somebody has worked this out. I copied this from some slides from Paul Hart. And the potential looks like it has a minimum and then goes up. So it looks like you know there should be a stable vacuum right there, which is the Mexican hat thing. But then eventually it can turn upside down and you can tunnel from the stable vacuum you have down to some crazy situation here where <laughs> the Higgs potential is, is going the other way. So it becomes unstable. And people have done the numerology and they find, wow, what an amazing accident of nature that the turning over thing depends on the top mass that you're putting in those loops. And if the top mass was any heavier, it would mean the Higgs to top coupling effectively is that much bigger. And so it would turn over sooner. And so our vacuum would be unstable and, and that's a complete disaster. I mean, it cannot happen. If the top mass was much less then the Yukawa coupling to the top would be smaller and it wouldn't have this problem. So that's fine. And we happen to have this amazing accident that the Higgs mass is just so at 125 and the top mass is just so at 172 something. And so in fact, it is turning upside down with those particular set of measured numbers, but in such a narrow sliver that the lifetime to tunnel from our locally stable vacuum to the unstable situation, that tunneling lifetime is so long that we're okay. You know, nothing will happen for whatever, 10 to the so many, so many years. So we are fine. But it's if it was a little bit down, I mean, if the calculation is right, then if it was anywhere over here, we would be wondering how come we are here still. So this is another accident. I mean, the whole thing is sort of full of accidents that you're in this tiny sliver of metastability where the standard model is viable as a theory of nature accidentally or coincidentally or something. Okay, so here's that list of puzzles. Um, scalar fields and condensed matter theory and so on, even QCD, pions and so on, but they've all, Cooper pairing, they've all been understood for a very long time as composite with some dynamical physics behind formation of that scalar. But this is the first time we have a fundamental scalar and it seems like that's what's creating all these uh, funny situations in QFT. Plus the fact that it's put in by hand all seems a little too good to be true. So in these bullets here is the statement um, why, for example, fermion masses do not get large quantum corrections because if you set the mass parameter to zero, this is that Tohoft argument as I get it, that the um, there is a bigger symmetry, there's a chiral symmetry. So then the quantum corrections are sort of protected by that chiral symmetry. So you don't get additive quantum corrections, you get multiplicative quantum corrections. And so therefore it becomes a logarithmic thing, dimensionless logarithmic. So things are running logarithmically for the Yukawa couplings, which is a very slow thing, so it's okay. Gauge boson mass are obviously protected by gauge invariance. As soon as you have a mass for a gauge boson, you don't have gauge invariance. So it's, uh, Higgs mechanism helping you out. So all that is great, but there's nothing with a single Higgs scalar that if you set the scalar mass to zero, you would get an additional symmetry. So therefore there's no symmetry protecting that mass. It should get large corrections. And so it feels like a strange beast. So the two things we've heard for some time, if you super symmetrize everything, then the Higgs gets a fermionic partners and the fermions get scalar partners. And since the fermions are protected by symmetry, now this partner is protected by the symmetry. And then because they are partners, it, you can sort of see why the Higgs would also get protected by the symmetry. So when you super symmetrize the standard model, then this issue, so that's always been something. More scalars and, and this additional symmetry helps you out. Or you just make it some dynamical, you know, Cooper pairing thing, Higgs, 
uh, sorry, a pion-like thing. It's not been so easy to create dynamical logics. I know a little bit about them, very little. But it's the other way of thinking how the Higgs will emerge dynamically when you are uh, looking like QCD physics or condensed matter physics or something that makes the scalars. Okay, so that's where the Higgs story sort of lies. Um, I showed you a couple of plots, but there are many, many. LHC produces all these plots checking every aspect of the Higgs properties to see with what experimental precision is it consistent with the standard model numbers. And within five to 10%, which is what the measurement accuracies are, they all seem to line up. So no large anomalies there. But five to 10% is, is great, but not, you know, it's not 10 to the minus three or even 1%. So there's plenty of room for some second Higgs that mixes with the first, things like this can still show up. So you just need more data. Okay, on dark matter, I guess I'll say very little. This is yet another unknown of the standard model. There is no candidate dark matter particle in the standard model whatsoever. We don't know this is particle. We could have seen talks about some very long wavelength classical field is out there that behaves like dark matter. You all probably know people have tried to modify Newtonian gravity or something to see if you can, but I don't know personally much about this field. I've just talked to experts and what I've learned from them is that modifying gravity seems to always run into some issue here or there or there, conflict here or conflict there. Whereas just putting non-relativistic dark matter of some sort, let's say particulate, uh, appears to fit. So this cold dark matter, dark energy, and Einstein gravity. So what is called the lambda CDM model. I think those are its basic key ingredients. It seems to fit. So now we are collecting so much astrophysics data. The old one was this rotation curve of galaxies. So this is the distance from the center of the galaxy. And this is the speed of the stars as they revolve around the galaxy. And if the gravity of the visible matter was put into the calculation, you would expect this mv square over r centripetal force would give you this speed. But what was observed for this, a very famous observation. Uh, first incident, and then there were galaxy cluster uh, observations. Then there was this collision of galaxy clusters that seems to separate out the dark matter from the visible that's producing X-rays. So this is a so-called bullet cluster that was observed, collisions of two galaxy clusters, that the gases in the galaxies collided there. And so the hot X-rays are coming from this pink region, but gravitational lensing is showing most of the mass is in the blue regions. So that mass is, is a different kind of mass from the interacting mass, the electromagnetic mass. So it's not, you can't just do it by adjusting gravity. These are two different kinds of, of mass particles. and so. Confirms dark matter. Lots of stuff, cosmic microwave background. So this is a quick plot showing uh, dark matter contribution in the universe and the dark energy contribution and lots of things seem to line up. So it, it looks like just some kind of gravitational interacting thing and hopefully from the experimental perspective, also having some kind of action with the standard model either through the Higgs or through gauge fields or something is hopefully <laughs> good for us because then we have an experimental shot at it. Otherwise we'll be speculating for a long time. So, so is there any idea, for example, to explain or predict a cross section, for example, of dark matter particles interacting with the nucleus, even approximate cross section? That would be a beautiful thing to have because then people can say, okay, if you make a detector big enough with a noise level low enough and a sensitivity high enough, you can actually reach that cross section as an observable and then we'll know that works or doesn't work. So I'll just show one plot here. This is the mass of the dark matter particle. So it's a quantum field theoretic uh, statement about dark matter. It's some particle, weakly interactive massive particle. And here's the cross-section of that particle to interact with the nucleus. 
long ago, 10 years ago, people thought, oh, if it interacted via the exchange of the Z boson, that would be amazing because it would just be an SU2 uh, particle interacting with the standard model weak interaction, which would be amazing. So people worked out the cross section for just a Z mediated interaction. And it was a certain value around here, if I remember right. And people said, oh, you know, we can build experiments that will eventually get become sensitive enough to that cross section. And we'll see the little recoil of the dark matter bouncing off the nucleus with the Z boson exchange. That cross section has been ruled out now for quite a while. So some sense of disappointment. So people are trying to build more QFT models where the action is not mediated by a single Z. Maybe it's mediated by a box diagram with two Ws and that would be much smaller cross section or it could be Higgs mediated, which would be a really small cross section uh, because the nucleus is mostly light particles. So you have to somehow go through Higgs. Higgs has to fluctuate into a top anti-top quark pair. And then the top quarks have to interact with the gluons the same way we make the Higgs, it would be the reverse reaction. So if I remember right, the Higgs mediator cross section is in some band over here. And now you can see another factors of 100 or so are being planned. So the current sensitivity is there and people are trying to go two orders of magnitude below with the next generation of direct detection experiments. And if that also doesn't see any recoils, I think the Higgs mediated would also be ruled out unless it was light. So I don't know what happens then because these experiments are not sensitive to light dark matter. And the reason is basic kinematics that the light dark matter when it recoils off a nucleus, the recoil energy is very small. So you just can't see that smaller recoil. So people are trying to do other technologies, but you can see their sensitivity is much less. So this is the state of the affairs in direct detection. There is, of course, the whole big enterprise of indirect detection. And what that means is if dark matter does have a field theory connection with standard model, then the, the, if you think of this as a P-channel exchange of dark matter with the nucleus, you could just turn that diagram around and say dark matter and anti-dark matter can annihilate out there in the galactic cloud. And that annihilation will produce some standard model energy once in a while, you know, W boson, Z boson decaying to electrons, muons, photons, and so on. So if you point experiments looking for flashes of energy up in the sky, uh, you might see such flashes which imply that you, you're noticing dark matter annihilation. Uh, and so people are trying to do that as well. That's called indirect detection. And the third one is, if it's got a field theory interaction, then the LHC with the right mass and the right cross section should produce it. So let's look for dark matter at the LHC. That's the third one. Nothing so far. So people are messing around with how weakly interacting could the dark matter be and we could still observe it. So it's a quest. Uh, we'll get lucky or we'll not get lucky in the next 10, 20 years. Okay. Uh, if it is only through gravity, which means it's not really standard model gauge interaction or anything. This is something completely different. It's completely inert. Then who knows what we do? Will we ever actually understand what it is? It's not clear. Okay. Let me see if I go through this logic in a few slides. The other, I guess the third mystery of the standard model is this matter antimatter asymmetry now that all ingredients of the standard model are fairly well accurately known, you can do the calculations, I can't remember, microsecond after the Big Bang or something like this. And the matter antimatter will annihilate itself out much, much, much more than sort of what we seem to see. So it looks like there is an asymmetry generating mechanism in nature at the time of the Big Bang. And the standard model doesn't have those mechanisms or at least some of those mechanisms. So what's going on? Maybe there's, that's already a reason to expand the standard model. So there's some new dynamics there. 
So we looked at it. I also mentioned it because I played with this for a while. I was doing this 100 TV collider coordination and we were thinking what kind of case would you make? And this was one case that was kind of nice because whatever additional physics there is, unlike supersymmetry, if you decoupled it from the standard model going to higher and higher masses or lower and lower couplings, then eventually the standard model becomes the dominant thing. And so you're back to having the asymmetry in the universe not being explained. In other words, to explain this asymmetry, you need that additional dynamics to be relatively close to the Higgs. And if it's a relative close, then you can quantify that and say, what kind of a high energy collider could you build to make sure you completely cover it? So it would be like a definitive yes, no kind of thing. Um, exclu excludable idea in a sense. So, so that's why we were pursuing it and we found the answer, we published it. That indeed with the appropriate luminosity and 100 TV collider in various model spaces, in the end it's all model dependent, but you try a bunch of models and you find you can cover that entire space. So, so that seemed like a nice thing. Okay. So just a quick status of this, uh, three Sakharov conditions, you need baryon number violation, um, you need charge and charge parity violation, and you need a departure from thermal equilibrium. So the last one I understand is, even if you created an asymmetry, the reverse process will still happen. So whichever one process is creating the asymmetry can go backwards and the asymmetry will again disappear. So if it's in thermal equilibrium, the asymmetry will wash out even if you have a mechanism to make it. So I, as I understand it, this condition says you need to generate the asymmetry and then somehow freeze it before it can wash out. And so that can only happen when you don't have thermal equilibrium. So there's something very interesting. I'd love to learn that more that if you do perturbative calculations alone, then this global symmetry of baryon number conservation and lepton number conservation are in the standard model accidentally, only if you do perturbative calculations. But if you allow non-perturbative, you know, full nonlinear field configurations, including the Higgs mechanism and the W fields and the Z fields and all that, there are sort of non-trivial topologically non-trivial, like winding number configurations, those are called sphalerons. When you put those in, which will be there at high enough energy, uh, like a plasma of Ws and Zs will, will have these configurations, uh, that those configurations actually violate B and L, but they only conserve B minus L. So B minus L is the true conserved in the standard model and B and L is, is, is separately or not. So. So the standard model can do be violation back then at the Big Bang time. In the quark sector, there is CP violation now observed for a long time, but people have done the math and you find it's not enough. The amount of CP violation you need is too little in the standard model, even though it's well established now, Nobel Prize and all for, for having it. Um, so more, and so people are thinking, well, if the Higgs sector was expanded, some other Higgs and then the turns of the second Higgs and the first Higgs together, you could easily put in CP violating terms there. And that would generate a lot more CP violation than what the standard model has. And that would do it. So we need something more. And then there's the third one. So this is one slide on where we stand with the CP violation in the standard model. So if the, the, the the Kobayashi Moscow Nobel Prize, I think, was for this, that as soon as you had three generations of fermions, then those Higgs couplings can have all kinds of phases, but most of them can be removed by absorbing them in the other fields and so forth. So the math works out. And with two generations, you cannot have a residual phase left. They can all be absorbed away, so they're not observable. But with three generations, there's one phase that you cannot eliminate, and so that became the sort of famous phase, the, the CP violating phase in the three by uh, three generation matrix of Yukawa couplings. So that is being parameterized here, I think as a real part and complex part of something. 
and the complex part exists because the phase is there. So that's why it's not a line, it's a triangle, so there's a complex part. So each of these bands is a whole bunch of experimental observations of various particles decaying, bottom quarks, charm quarks, strange quarks, various observables, where you're sampling aspects of that matrix. And when you stick all the observable quantities together, they don't directly map into points, they map into regions uh, in this plane. So every experimental observation or experimental measurement becomes a region that is constrained. And amazingly, it's become a very, very precise thing. You can see narrow bands everywhere. And they all beautifully seem to intersect at that little circle there. And so with that kind of precision, which is pretty good now after 25 years of this, it looks like this three generation thing is holding together with one CP violating phase, does it all nicely. Uh, so the experiments that are running at the LHC, LHC B and there's a Japan uh, super, what do they call it? Super B factory or something like this are also in the same game, trying to get more B mesons produced, more B quarks, more decays to charm and everything else, and try to make all these experimental constraints even narrower and narrower, and see maybe that this triangle is not really a triangle. So, so all the bands don't really intersect at the same point. And so then the, the unitarity argument of the three by three system is, is violated which might indicate a fourth generation or might indicate something else. I don't know what it indicates. But so, so that's the motivation for all the experiments continuing to make these particular experiments, uh, measurements, I don't know. I think the goal is like make it 10 times, five to 10 times more precise. And then you can look at this intersection still holds or not. So that's the status of CP violation in the standard model. Seems to work so far, okay. Then there is this last thing, which is the um, out of thermal equilibrium business. So second order is not quite right. I think my, my space transitions physics has gone a little weak. But there is a, a kind of transition that the observed Higgs mass allows you to calculate in the standard model. So the, the, the Higgs mass that we found, 125 GV is large enough that when you do the QFT with the standard model at various temperatures, high temperature and then zero temperature, these are various temperature dependent curves, the Higgs potential as you calculate as a function of temperature goes from this shape at high temperature to this shape at low temperature. So this is where you get the condensate eventually. So you could imagine that the Big Bang, the temperature is cooling and the Higgs potential is slowly changing its shape. But when it changes its shape this way, that kind of transition doesn't create a non-equilibrium situation. It doesn't, I think the right statement is it, it sort of keeps the thermal equilibrium going. So if there is any asymmetry of, of matter antimatter, it cannot get locked in, so it would get washed away. So this kind of a transition that the standard model predicts now quite accurately, I believe we'll give you some reference here, violates the third Sakharov condition too. You need the phase transition to be like this, which I think is called strongly first order phase transition, uh, where as you cool down, the shape becomes this kind of shape. And then this creates what they call bubble nucleation. So that's what I've been told, that the, the phase that accumulates here is accumulating in these bubbles, and those bubbles will grow very rapidly. And so whatever antimatter asymmetry you generate gets frozen in to these bubbles. The bubbles expand and fill up all space so you don't get any chance to wash out that asymmetry. So whatever is generated gets frozen in and so we have the asymmetry now. So this is the first order phase transition is the one that creates this bubble nucleation. So people are, I think, looking for things like when these bubble domain walls collide, Will you get gravitational waves from the beginning, from the time of the Big Bang? And can you observe those gravitational waves now? You see this whole gravitational wave astronomy is, is really kicking off. And one of the things is, 
if these bubbles are colliding with each other as they grew, you, the gravitational waves will still be around sort of something much, much, much earlier than the cosmic microwave background. And if you could prove that that's the gravitational wave background you're seeing, you, you would be proving this. Sounds like an amazing experimental feat if that could be done. So this, this doesn't work in the standard model. So if you want this to work, you have to do something more. Okay, uh, 11.50, maybe we can wrap up soon enough. A few words now on the experimental side. I mentioned we'd like to measure Higgs properties better. Maybe anomaly will show up. So a circular collider has the maximum rate, maximum luminosity. So you make many more Higgs this way. The most advanced proposal on the table for the last 10 years is a linear collider which at some point 20 years ago, the US wanted to build and then the Japanese wanted to build and even maybe the Germans wanted to build. But through various things, nobody's built one, not clear who will do it. A new technology is showing up that does not have to be superconducting, which is copper cavity based. So when you accelerate the electrons with microwave cavities, you can do it with copper cavities, which has been this thing in the end of the collider. There's one more technology like that which CERN has also pursued. Now CERN is talking about the same. One way to do it is a 100 TV collider. So you can see this is the Large Hadron Collider's sort of as seen from space. And Geneva is a city over there. And this is the, the lake uh, next to Geneva, uh, mountains around us. So the blue line would be a 100 TV collider circle. Uh, it would be 100 kilometers around roughly rather than the 27 of the LHC. So you can see how much bigger it gets. There is a few sites in China that have been isolated where a similar size tunnel could be done. The, the, the tunneling is pure, I mean, it's not easy civil engineering, but bigger and more complicated tunnels have been dug in the world. Many, many cities have, have it. So people know how to build tunnels, mostly a matter of money. But what you need in it are these very strong magnets to bend the protons around. So we're looking for magnets would be twice as strong as the magnets in the LHC. And so that requires a really new technology and that we don't really have, people are working on it. So that's the other requirement to do this, which is why it, it won't get started for a while. We need to have those magnets. Now, the last thing I'll say on this topic, this particular kind of collider, which is instead of colliding protons and electrons, which are, free, you can find them for free. Muons have to be made. So making muons is not easy. Making a very compact beam out of them so that you get lots of luminosity when you collide the beams is really hard. And that's an unsolved problem. Uh, so R&D is being discussed on this. But the nice thing about muons is they're point particles. So when you collide muons at 10 TV, it's equivalent in many ways to protons colliding at 100 TV because the typical quark or gluon in the proton has only one tenth of the proton's energy. So a typical collider, proton collider energy is really a 10 TV collider. The muons can give you the whole 10 TV all in that muon. So that's the big advantage. So here is a Fermi lab picture. This is the physical site of Fermi National Lab near Chicago. And uh, people are working out that you could literally fit this thing on the site, which has lots of engineering benefits and financial benefits and many things. So we, we'll see the, the, the size of the muon color is attractive, the energy is attractive. Uh, making beams out of muons is extremely difficult. And unless that gets solved, we don't know if the muon color is actually practical. So, all right. Um, neutrinos, two small masses, I think you know this, rather than cook up 
even more widely different numbers for the Yukawa couplings, maybe a smarter way is invoke some higher dimension operator. So there's some dynamical reason mixing with the with a right-handed neutrino sector, which could be sterile, for example. So sterile neutrinos and right-handed neutrinos get discussed quite a bit these days for the whole neutrino physics program. Because if something showed up, they would suddenly start explaining why the neutrino sector behaves in this strange way, that there's a, there's a dynamical reason for it, for example. So that would be great. Then there is the whole Majorana logic, quite old that this particle may, may not have a gate charge and therefore its particle antiparticle may not, do not have to be different. So if it's its own antiparticle, then you get this famous neutrino less double beta decay. So there are two beta decays going on, but the two neutrinos annihilate each other out because they're their own antiparticles. So you get nothing except two electrons and all the energy of the beta decays is showing up in the visible energy of the electrons. So very beautiful signal, but it could be very small. So that's a big angle in neutrino physics is if neutrinos were established with this process, surely a major discovery in the field, but it would add this new insight. Ah, nature manifests Majorana particles also, which creates its own new set of possibilities in the future. The actual values of the neutrino masses, no con there's only constraints, no measurement. So basically beta decay, measuring the energies of the visible products and trying to infer what the mass of the neutrino would be. Difficult job, so just bounds. Three neutrino mixing, ignoring the sterile, what are the pattern of the masses? This is the famous normal hierarchy versus inverted hierarchy problem. That the, th the mass eigenstates, which are the mixtures of the three flavor eigenstates, those mass eigenstates may have this kind of a mass splitting, small mass splitting for the two lighter ones and a bigger mass splitting for the third one, or the inverted one, which would be unusual that the two heavy ones are de almost degenerate and then they are much heavier than the lightest one, which is sitting down here. So this motivates yet another range of experiments, make lots of neutrinos, make antineutrinos, look at the mixing pattern and so forth and see if you can infer what kind of mass hierarchy there is, uh, because either is possible at the moment. So all of this, at the moment is captured in a kind of mixing matrix, like a flavor mixing matrix that makes the mass eigenstates. So this is the equivalent of the CK matrix for the quarks. This is now on the fermionic side. And could there be more generations? Could there be phases in here? The same CKM program has been pursued. It will never become as precise, nowhere near like the 1% and so on. But most people say, 20, 30, 20% accuracy on, on knowing something about this matrix could tell us a lot. Some people say, no, it doesn't tell us much. <laughs> so that debate is going on, whether measuring properties of this matrix to a certain precision is helps you or doesn't really tell you much interesting. But leave that debate. Okay. The last thing, since you, know, you mentioned it, I sort of wanted to advertise. I guess most of my career among you know, one steady theme has been measured this one precise quantity called the mass of the W boson. It's because I entered collider physics and it's one of the things in collider physics that you can measure very precisely. And as time went on, its calculation from the standard model also became more and more precise with the top mass becoming more precise and MZ becoming precise. And now the Higgs is also known. So like we were saying earlier, as soon as you get something that's calculable, it becomes a target for an experimentalist or experimentalist to go and see if nature is that way or something else. So, you the target. so when you do the quantum corrections in the standard model, the Higgs and new physics and everything can generate quantum corrections to the self energy corrections to the W boson and to the Z boson. But if the Z boson is spin down to the measured value, then now the W is a, is a predictable thing. And so you can check if the answer you measure in the experiment is the same as the prediction or not. 
So that's the statement here. So here is the standard model calculation. So that's what I want to illustrate that the parameters that are input to the calculation and the theoretical uncertainty on the calculation are both pretty small. So this becomes an attractive target for somebody like me and my colleagues to go and measure and see if we get this number. And theories abound. So all the things we discussed, and this is where I, I sort of say, if the Octonian logic or something starts to make calculations possible for such observables that we can actually measure, that would be exactly what we want. And then I think, you get tons of traction with the experimental community because they say, ah, if you give us something to measure, now we are talking business, something like that. So, so that's why these kinds of things always get mentioned because they do give you some experimental target. Uh, you may find it or not find it, but that's science. So that's good. Okay. Let me skip some of this. What, one particular model I like is you throw in one extra Higgs and may even not have standard model quantum numbers. I mean, standard model gauge charges at all. It could be a SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 scalar singlet. But because it's a scalar, it will mix with the Higgs. And so it may interact with other sectors and so on. Um, but it's like scalars give you access to other scalars very easily because you can make Lagrangian terms out of scalars and scalars. And so if you throw something very simple like this in there, a, you can make this phase transition first order like we wanted, rather easy to do. So, ah, okay, nice. Efficient mechanism for doing something we want. And secondly, then I say, what does it do to the W mass? And it creates a rather large correction to the calculated value of the W mass. And I say, oh, great, then, then let's go measure it and see, see what happens. Supersymmetric loops can do the same thing, okay. At the end, here we are. So you mentioned that Tejinder, so here's that number we've been measuring for the last 10 years. And there were other CDF measurements. This is an experiment at Fermilab and these are experiments elsewhere. So we've all been measuring mass of the W boson for a long time, trying to make it more and more precise. And so CDF has done it five times I was, part of that for three of those times. And then D0 has done it and I was part of that twice. So I've been working on CDF and D0 for 27 years doing this over and over again, just learning from the mistakes. So it, it's an interesting story because the first time I entered the game as a postdoc, the uncertainties used to be 150 MeV, 200 MeV. And then N years later, it became 100 MeV and then 50 MeV and then 20 MeV. And another 10 years later, it's nine MeV. So slow grind, but if you do factors of two improvements every seven years, <laughs> and you spend 25 years on it, you, you get two raised to five, or two raised to four or something. So it, it works, eventually you get something. So there's been a lot of discussion. You see this large seven sigma from the standard model. I haven't shown you any experimental stuff. So separate talk. There used to be a general pattern, numbers used to be high. A few couple of recent measurements from Bezier and Atlas came out closer to the standard model. As you can see, high, but much closer. So now you can see the usual sociology we are discussing. Let's ex compare experimental details. Let's compare the robustness of all those techniques. How is CDF doing it? We can do more checks. Let's Let's just put all our details on the table and, and sit around and figure out how the experiments are being done. So there's sort of a three sigma difference between CDF measurement and the couple of other more recent measurements. Uh, and three sigmas happen in experimental science and so you just have to figure out who, who's closer to the right answer. But my sense still is, I'm biased of course, that there is something going on here. There is a, an anomalous thing happening in this particular observable. Well, let me leave it at that. And it sounds to me a little bit like the, the famous experiment from Lamb and colleague, I forget his name, where they had a calculable energy for two states of hydrogen and they did clever microwave techniques. And those energy levels were compared and they found a 10 to the minus six, really 10 to the minus six difference in 1948. 
between something that was calculated and something that was measured. And it turned out when the theory came along of QFT with electrodynamics and everything, that that little difference was exactly what was calculable with the loops, uh, the famous quantum loops that we now know of. So the vacuum polarization and so on was the reason Lamb and company were seeing this. So sometimes precision measurements can show you stuff. So last thing I'll say, soon after this CDA paper came out, literature started showing up. My point is, there's an early snapshot of the kinds of ideas that people were throwing around to explain the anomaly. The citation count in a few weeks was 60 and now it's 400 plus. So people are still thinking, people are still thinking. Um, but some extension of the standard model to include supersymmetry or additional fermions. You notice it's not chiral fermions. Chiral fermions are already additional generations of chiral fermions are not, at some level of precision are excluded. Of course, it's always at some level of precision are excluded by the CKM testing and by the Higgs cross section. So if you want to throw in fermions, you have to throw in non-chiral. So they don't have the Higgs interaction necessarily. That their mass doesn't come from the Higgs mechanism. So then it's fine. Extensions of the Higgs sector, extensions of the Higgs sector, extensions of the gauge sector. So what can you extend? The fermionic sector, gauge sector, or Higgs sector, and people are trying to extend any of them to see what can explain what. So may maybe my, my maybe last word here is, wh when this octonian logic, for example, can start computing things like this, it, it, you'd like to have that stuff in the pie as well not just for this precision observable, but for Higgs properties or gauge boson properties or the couplings of gauge bosons to each other. Um, maybe longitudinal gauge bosons are different in your way of looking at it from transverse gauge bosons and maybe there's some effect shows up there. Tejinthar, I'm repeating what your colloquium said, sterile neutrinos would be an amazing thing, but the next step somebody will ask is, can you give some idea of what the mixing probability would be so between standard model and sterile or something like this? Mm -hmm. So we can do the appropriate oscillation experiment to see it. Mm -hmm. um, or if we had a trillion Z bosons and the Z bosons are decaying to neutrinos, if some of those neutrinos are mixing into the sterile, maybe the Z boson width would be just a little bit different. And if you tell us it could be 10 to the minus three different or 10 to the minus four different, now we have a target. You know, measure the Z width or something to 10 to the minus four, if it could be done. Could be done with a trillion Zs, it could be done. So you just have to think hard enough how to do it. So um, I guess, let me just focus on this. I'm advertising again taking this opportunity, but that first bullet, lots of open questions. Uh, so personally, it's not like the standard model will be wrong or something. It, it's somehow it wants to be embedded inside a bigger thing is the way I feel about it. Everybody has a different opinion on this, but some bigger construct, which you can see how the standard model embeds in it would then explain why we've been seeing what we've been seeing but if you go beyond and, and find more observables or something at higher precision or higher energy or whatever, then you start to see the, the larger structure, which is how we got this far. And so probably that's the pattern that will continue. Okay, thanks so much for the opportunity. You've been listening very kindly and attentively. Uh, I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ashutosh. That was a really beautiful lecture, very valuable for theorists who get an experimentalist, a particle physicist perspective of what is expected from us so that we can talk to you more actively. That's it's very useful. So we open the talk for questions now. Uh, kindly use the raise hand feature and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question.
So, okay, maybe I'll just get the ball rolling until questions, more questions come. So uh, one thing which uh, the Octonion, I mean, my, my approach uh, suggests is that the Higgs is definitely a composite. It is not fundamental. Okay. And perhaps it's a composite of the very fermions to which it is supposed to give masses, including three sterile neutrinos. What more should we have to tell for this to be tested or ruled out experimentally? Um, already you've said something very powerful. So, so in general, the, the sort of maybe it's the same way, but I know of two ways. A, when you measure the Higgs coupling to say the Ws or the Zs or something like this, it's been calculated even with the other, you know, various other SU4 compositeness or SO5 compositeness or whatever, um, that these couplings would not exactly be standard model like. So then you say, what's the deviation? How much, how do you quantify the deviation or parameterize the deviation? So the typical logic goes that you can parameterize that as some EFT thing, effective field theory terms, dimension six operator. Um, and so then you say that the deviation of that measure of that coupling from the standard model coupling would scale as the ratio of two energy scales. So it's a coupling deviation, so it's a dimensionless thing. So it must scale as the ratio of two energies. So the numerator energy is typically the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs, well measured 246 GV. So that's typically put thrown up there in the numerator. And the denominator is the coefficient of the dimension six operator, for example. So if it has a lambda square in the denominator, then it's Higgs vacuum expectation value over lambda square. So a typical experimentalist will think this way. The, the, the EFT mindset is fairly common. It's, it's how it's trying to get spoken about. So you say if, if the composite thing kicks in at one TV or two TV, roughly speaking, I'll put one or two TV in the denominator, 246 GV in the numerator and square that, assuming it's a dimension six operator, dimension five would be good, good obviously, but as far as I know, you can't make a dimension five operator like this while it's something, something. Okay. So 246 over one GV is one fourth, you square it is one sixteenth. So at one TV, which is not so high, you only get a couple of percent deviation. If you make it two TV, then it's a fraction of a percent deviation. Mm -hmm. So this is what the experiment will say. Okay, so you want me to measure that coupling to 1%, half a percent, the other approach is let's collide the vector boson. So you go to this longitudinal vector boson scattering setup. So two quarks come in with some small rate, they emit longitudinal vector bosons, which are the, the Higgs modes, the Goldstone modes. And so you have these Goldstone bosons colliding like pions colliding and out come two other bosons. So you look for the two bosons coming out and the radiated quark. So you can tag this whole topology. And you start measuring the rates and you start measuring the angular distributions. So imagine at the beginning of QCD times in the seventies and so on, people were doing pion proton scattering and so on. And you start seeing the proton cross form factor. You start seeing the pion form factor and so on. So what would it take to see the form factors hiding inside? So it's not a point particle, but it has a form factor characterized by one over lambda, the size. So in a sense, I think I'm saying you'd like you, if you told us a kind of lambda, or you converted your logic into a lambda. Mm -hmm. So one TV plus or minus whatever, it's a five TV plus or minus whatever. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much enough. Immediately okay. people can start saying ballpark, this is what we would have to do. Okay. okay. So many processes, I think 
Vector boson scattering is a good one. It's a scattering of goldstones, composites, and couplings to the light states mm -hmm. could, could cause form factor induced deviations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I will come back to it maybe more. Anthony, you please go ahead kindly ask your question. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I think when you were going through dark matter candidates, you didn't mention sterile neutrinos there. Do you think they have good potential? Uh, so I don't work in that field. Let, let me say what I think is right. All of the cosmological fits, so the galaxy, the structure formation of the universe, the CMB, I'm probably missing something else, I don't know. But anyway, these things all seem to point to the dark matter being non-relativistic. The logic goes that if dark matter was relativistic, the pressure that it would generate as the universe was expanding would outweigh the gravitational clumping tendency of the matter. So it would act more like radiation and less like matter if it was relativistic. And so more outward pressure implies large scale structure and everything gets smoothed out. And it looks like the fits all favor that dark matter acts attractively gravitationally. So it attracts more like attractive matter rather than radiative pressure. And that's why you get the large scale structure, otherwise you wouldn't. Given that there's four times as much dark matter as visible matter. And so that tells you it must be relativistic, which, uh, sorry, that tells you it must be non-relativistic. So now it's like, typically when I hear the word neutrino, I feel like we're talking of a light sterile. Yeah. But if, if you tell me it's uh, TV, then it's definitely heavy sterile and then it's perfectly fine dark matter. But is that what you're saying? Heavy sterile? Well, well I, I'm wondering, you know, something which would satisfy the type constraints you're talking about there might be a few KEB, something like that, and still be okay as regards the structure formation. But I don't really know if that's a possible type of mass for these sterile neutrinos. Uh, I'm a little confused on the math here, Masa. I should go ask some experts or something. Ah. Because I hear that axionic dark matter, the, the solution to the strong CP problem, is now in vogue. I've asked people why suddenly it's in vogue, because I've thought about it for ages. Mostly it's sociological because the LHC hasn't found anything new, so let's think of something else. That, that's half the story, I think. But anyway, that's fair enough. Axionic dark matter can be extremely light, but it doesn't follow this logic that if it's that light, it must be relativistic, and therefore it would screw up structure formation and so on. That logic doesn't apply to axions somehow. I don't know why. But if that's true, then maybe it doesn't apply to the KAV neutrinos either. I, I think it, the, the logic does apply to the sterile neutrinos. And so they have to be above a, a few KV limit, I think. It's something of that order. I see. So KV would be very good because it's well, well within the range of, for example, the Z boson decays. So A, if this future collider got built and we produced a trillion Z bosons and we measured the width accurately. And there was some mixing between the standard model neutrinos, which the Z decays into and the steriles. Then the Z width would be affected, I think. And so that's, KAV is very nice because it's light enough, it's very light as far as the Z goes, plenty of phase space. And then the, neutrino oscillation experiments, which are in fact looking for things like this to do. <laughs> I'll tell you something which will not be well known. Fermilab is building an extremely high energy proton power proton accelerator. And a lot of that beam could actually be exploited for sterile neutrino searches. Um, and in some sense, there isn't a program being proposed Usually the physics is there and the beam is not. And you have to figure out how to build the beam. We are at a 
fortunate place where the beam is being built for other neutrino things. And sterile neutrinos is a fantastic thing to look for. So if you'd say some kind of mixing probability, what would be the oscillation length of electron neutrino, muon neutrino, something because of the sterile mixing? Uh, what rates would we need to see some 5% effect or 20% effect? Th there is an opportunity here. And this, we are talking 10 years. Within 10 years, this will be operational. So I think for sterile neutrinos, I say we need predictions now. We can start proposing literally now. So could I just sort of barge in, Ashutosh, thank you. Related to this, suppose a statement is made that uh, assuming three sterile neutrino exists, one for each generation, and something, some fundamental quantum number other than mass uh, distinguishes them from each other. Uh, is it possible for sterile neutrinos to act as an avenue for uh, neutrino flavor oscillations, even if the neutrinos are massless? Sterile as well as active neutrinos are massless, but I might be able to think of a mechanism in which the active neutrinos can oscillate to sterile neutrinos and back. Would you rule this out as impossible? I don't see any experimental way of, at the moment, saying impossible. No, I cannot say it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know enough, but from what I yeah, know- so my, my contention with some of my colleagues with whom I talk is, they say that neutrino oscillations imply that neutrinos have a non-zero mass. I say, if you assume neutrinos have a non-zero mass, you can use mass eigenstates as a channel to explain the observed oscillations. Would you say the second one is correct rather than the first one? I think it's the second one that's correct. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, it, uh, I feel better, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, should, I should check some textbook for this, right? Uh, yeah, some of my neutrino physics colleagues say it is a college undergraduate physics to conclude that also <laughs> my mass. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, I, it's important for me. What I'm seeing in my work is that uh, it seems naively at least that the only way for something to have a mass is for it to also have an electric charge. So I find it for me at least very difficult to understand how the neutrinos acquire mass in my picture, whereas there decisively are three sterile neutrinos, which are characterized by some quantum number. And it can happen when the flavor eigenstates are expressed as superposition of sterile neutrino eigenstates. It appears as if the neutrino is massive. Uh, it, uh, whereas fundamentally the mass number is zero. But of course, I, I don't have a proof yet of showing these oscillations or calculating the PMNS matrix parameters. I was just saying that it was not obvious to me that oscillations imply a non-zero mass. Uh, yeah, I think that's the standard two-state mixing. That's all that's being stated there, that we, we believe, I think believe is right. We believe that the neutrino you produce is a flavor eigenstate. Yes. Believe that the neutrino you detect is a flavor eigenstate. And the neutrino that propagates is a mass eigenstate. Yeah. So, so that's, I think those are sort of the, the basic facts. Now, yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. You finish, please. Yeah, I was just saying. So, what we see in the textbook is is unless there is a splitting of mass, then the flavor eigenstate can always be redefined such that 
the propagating state is also a flavor eigenstate. And so you can sort of redefine your mixing until the mixing is gone and you haven't changed anything. You've just redefined your fields. Mm -hmm. So by definition, you've eliminated the notion of mixing because the, the, the state that propagates, the mass eigenstate that propagates also is the flavor eigenstate. So how can you tell one from the other? The standard paradigm is because they're different masses. So now this distinguishes flavor eigenstate from mass eigenstate. Yeah. So my picture uh, has been to associate flavor eigenstates with left chiral fermions and mass eigenstates with right chiral fermions. Awesome. And one Higgs gives electric charge to the right-handed fermions and the standard model Higgs gives mass to the left-handed fermion. And this is not allowed for the neutrino. So the mass eigenstates of mass zero are associated with the sterile neutrinos and charge eigenstates of charge zero are associated with the active neutrinos. And uh, these can talk to each other in principle. So what you're saying is that the neutrinos, none of these neutrinos have Higgs Yukawa. They, yes, yes, the true. Higgs at all. There's no Higgs involved in the neutrino sector. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this mechanism is not, your mechanism is not commonly known. So that's why the people who, you, who are arguing with you I think are arguing on the basis of sort of the known or believed upon Higgs mechanism mm -hmm. generation of mass. And, and there they're right. If that's on, on that premise, they're right. Okay, I thank think you. If, you, if you take away the Higgs sector away from the neutrino completely, then there's nothing all that is off. So you, you might be right. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we, we, I take the next question. Burnt, please go ahead. Uh, I kindly, yeah, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, it's just a brief comment uh, on your little discussion. I think uh, the proof that uh, neutrino oscillations imply a mass for neutrinos are based on, on the standard formulation of quantum field theory. And your model is a little bit different because you use the octonians and you have non associativity this might be a reason why you see this difference and maybe it would be helpful or yeah, to just point this out or to, to give this as an explanation to the experimentalist why you don't need to have math to have the neutrino oscillations because your model is fundamentally different from quantum field theory. Yeah, I agree, thank you. Yeah, that's very useful, thank you. Thank you. That's all. I agree. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, it sounds like, is this written down? It's there briefly mentioned in the E8 cross E8 proposal paper, but we have not, we, we want to, we are hopeful we'll be able to calculate the PMNS matrix from first principles. If we can do that, then we'll present it to the community. Until we do that, uh, we just have some statements here and there. We, we are trying this. I, the, comment I just heard makes me realize, even if you can't calculate the PMNS matrix, G. just a short paper that simply explains that because it's not the QFT way of looking at it, just the objection that massless neutrinos can't, can't oscillate, that basic objection is not valid this in itself should be written up now, I think. Ah, oh, that, 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 that's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. I, I take note. I, I definitely keep that in mind. Yes, yes. Thank One you. page, I mean, you know, you grow up in field theory lectures and somebody tells you there was this big puzzle somewhere and uh, I remember the prime example. Padiv Popov ghosts, there was some QFT thing and Somebody writes a tiny little paper and suddenly it resolves some mm -hmm. quantity, right? Yes, so one yes. example I remember, it was really a very small paper, but it suddenly resolved a quantity. Right. So you could have a one page PRL which just writes this logic down accurately. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then everybody says, oh, 
you know, we should not just keep throwing the QFT logic as an objection to a non-QFT logic. Uh, yes, that you put it very clearly. Yeah, uh, Anthony, please go ahead. Hi, I had a question on another topic. I don't think you mentioned the G minus two anomaly for the muon. Do you think that is something that is pointing to new physics that uh, could be really useful? Yeah, very uh, good. As I said, there's probably like more I didn't put in my slides than I put in the slides. I'm sure there's a factor of five more out there, <laughs> which will take 10 hours, even if I know it, which I probably don't. G minus two is close to my heart. I have friends working that experiment. A, B is running at Fermilab. I visit there. It used to be, so a couple of years ago, it was four something sigma. So when the Brookhaven and the, the first formula result got averaged, which kind of agreed with each other, it became 4.2 sigma. At the same time, in the same nature issue, literally the journals issue, this BMW group, and I know this person, uh, Hungarian physicist, Zoltan Fodor, I don't know him accidentally. So he in this, his group published in the same thing, in the same issue, coincidentally, that they recalculated the non-perturbative hadronic quantum corrections, the vacuum polarization due to hadronic non-perturbative effects on the lattice. So for G minus two, you have to run the alpha electromagnetic from Q square of zero up to, I guess, Q square of muon. And so somewhere or higher, and somewhere in there, you have to put the non-perturbative stuff in. And when they read it, that part on the lattice, that changed the value of the fine structure constant. It's a calculated number, you have to put that in. And so that changed the calculated number. So it changed the calculated value of G minus two. So now the 4.2, the experiment is as is, but the 4.2 sigma became 1.8 sigma or two sigma. So a couple of sigma shift of the calculated G minus two took away the discrepancy from the calculation. Now, what to make of that? Uh, so that created this, the lattice people went off. Then I talked to this person again, year and year ago, six months ago. So a year and a half had passed. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, then other lattice people who do the fermions differently, all this, numerical recipes and the lattice and how you handle the fermion loops and so on. They redid this, we all started benchmarking against each other and started finding agreement. So now there is a convergence of five different lattice calculations, approximately saying the same thing, that indeed the fine structure constants running has to be changed. And so the real G minus two discrepancy is not 4.2 sigma anymore, but two sigma. Oh. So maybe there is still a discrepancy, but but until this lattice thing settles down, we can't say how much. Right, um, I, I hadn't realized that uh, several other groups are now repeated those particular calculations and there is agreement. So that's interesting. That was, a, it was an internal, I think, turmoil there because for the longest time they were using the dispersion relations and using the calc the measured cross section of E plus E minus to hadrons. So E plus E minus goes to all everything divided by muons and the denominator. So that ratio, that's got all the QCD stuff in there. And you could use dispersion relation, turn that around to tell you how to evolve alpha. That input was being used all the time to get the 4.2 sigma situation. So now this means that the dispersion relation extracted alpha running and the lattice alpha running are different. That, that's what takes the two sigma away out of the four. Well, now you say which one's right. So all the lattice start to agree, but maybe they're all wrong and the data were right, but, <laughs> but that's getting harder to argue. There's a five different lattice people that are talking quite a bit to each other. So I have a bias 
view of this because I went and looked at the data. And it seems the quality of those data were actually not as good as we thought all this time. There is something from Russia, there is something from Italy, and maybe something from China. There's a scatter between the data themselves. So somebody averaged all of those and put in the average into the dispersion relation. But the scatter between the data itself was never taken sufficiently seriously to think, ah, are we putting in the wrong thing into the dispersion relation? So now it starts to motivate, like, could somebody go back and remake those experimental points of E plus E minus to hadron cross sections? The issue is who's, who's running at one GV? Nobody's got an E plus E minus collider of one GV anymore because everybody thought that's old news. The sociology of the field is quite interesting, right? Suddenly obsolete things become extremely relevant. Right. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Yeah. I, I think there is a Russian place still working. Is it an Italian place still working? So somebody should go back and somehow use the latest experimental technology to measure the one GV plus E minus cross section again. Maybe that will settle it that the lattice is right. Or not. Yeah. More questions, please. So, okay, so Ashutosh, as a theorist, suppose I offer to you the following as a prediction that the mass ratio of the electron and the up quark and the down quark is perfectly one is to four is to nine in the same spirit in which their electric charge ratios are three is to two is to one. Would this count as a prediction which would get experimentalists Interested or would they say no? We already know this. My immediate reaction is I forget exactly how the muon mass, or how the electron mass is measured. Clever stuff goes on there. The muon mass is also very well measured. So, you know, I'm talking about electron up and down. The, the electron up and down masses. The so what does it mean? Electron up and down means what? Up quark, down quark. Oh, up quark, down quark. First generation, first generation. If I look at the error bars in the coated masses, they have some uncertainty range, but these coated masses allow the interpretation that their mass ratios are exactly one is to four is to nine. And there's a theoretical reason for this, which is related to the fact that their electric charge ratios are three is to two is to one. Down quark is one third, up is two third, electron is one. For this very same reason, the mass ratios are flipped. The down quark is nine times more massive than the electron because its electric charge is one third that way. I can justify this. Would this count as a prediction? Like you have error bars, I'm saying one sort of yeah. expect. Yeah. The, the experimental reaction will be that the up and down quarks are not observable. So as a simple minded experimentalist, one says, what do I do? Give, give me an observable. So, so then, so, then somebody like from the lattice community would say the pion and the rho and all the hadron spectroscopy they can compute now, those are observables. So if you, if you buy the lattice rigorously, then the up and down quark masses that are put in there as inputs to the lattice, mm -hmm. turn through the lat crank, which hopefully gets more and more accurate with more computing and cleverer computing and everything else. Mm -hmm. If you then start making the predictions of the pion mass to the rho mass to whatever, the hadron spectroscopy, mm -hmm. if the hadron spectroscopy is getting predicted more and more accurately, mm -hmm. 
as a result of the input up and down quark mass becoming constrained rather than free parameters, yeah. you could string that logic together and say, now the up and down quark mass, even though they're not observable, they are inferable parameters. Right. And now I have something to talk about. Because actually this is the cleanest prediction I can make right now. I mean, if this is not true, then my theory falls, it fails. The theory but, very clearly says that this ratio has to be one is to four is to now nine to, you know, per, uh, whatever accuracy you want. So let me put it this way. If, if we had a lattice, experts here and they said in five years we will get enough computing and techniques would improve of calculations and the, the lattice spacing would get smaller and the continuum limit would get better and all kinds of good things. So that if you change the input quark masses by one MeV or mm -hmm. five MeV, and all their hadron spectroscopy predictions change by whatever, 5% or 1% or something. And then we go and measure those hadron masses also to half a percent. Mm -hmm. Now we have a story. Oh, yes, I understand. So I don't know if the other two if statements are true. Okay. But you know, I, na naively as an outsider, I was saying, in the particle review data book does quote quark, up quark and down quark masses. So they mean something, I suppose, right? Maybe they go by the lattice, uh, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, I, I agree with you, they're not observable, but it does get quoted. So in whatever sense, it has a meaning. In that sense, I was saying the prediction is something like 149. So can you tell me exactly whatever is in the PDG, what the actual ratios are to some decimal place? Uh, oh. <laughs> I mean, we can do this offline. We, we don't have to yeah, now. I'll have to open my paper. I don't Fine. remember. I'll, I'll write to you. Burnt, please go ahead. Um, I have a question concerning uh, the concept of math. It's related to what uh, Tejinda said earlier. You said that uh, in your model, only charged particles get mass. Uh, what is the mechanism behind this? And is there a link to gravity or is this independent? Okay, so um, um, I, I take two minutes to tell you my story. Mm -hmm. That uh, I, this is what I noticed, I was very struck by that the square root mass ratio of the electron up and down is one is to two is to three which is a flip of their charge ratio, three is to two is to one. So this was one of the reasons which motivated me to introduce uh, a new U1 symmetry, analogous to U1 electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. Electric charge, Pia Cole is here. So I sort of was in, inspired by her work where she shows that the electric charge uh, essentially is the result, the quantized electric charge is a result of the U1 EM being a number operator in the octonion picture. And mm -hmm. the allowed values are zero, one third, two third, one. So in, in, in parallel to that, I define the new U1 symmetry, U1 graph, which is there in the theory. And U1 graph has the same quantum numbers zero, one third, two third, one. But I switched the look, the relative position of the right-handed uh, down quark and the right-handed electron. Okay. So that the U1 graph values are now for the masses. So mass or so square root mass for me is the quantum number uh, eigenvalue allowed for the U1 graph number operator. Okay. And for the right handed sterile neutrino, this is coming out to be zero. And that, and for the left handed active neutrino, the mass is the charge is zero. For the right handed sterile neutrino, the square root mass is zero. And the Higgs couplings are such that the only way to get mass is if you have electric charge. 
I I don't know. That's what you're asking. Yes, yes, that's what I'm asking. And so, so, so you have a, an additional gravity symmetry, correct? With this yeah, UN graph. Yeah. So okay, so and so, so to make our speaker happy, is there any way to measure this or to, to verify this new gravitational symmetry in nature? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, Bernd, I'll come back to that. I want to say something, then we can okay. discuss this. In the meanwhile, Gregory has a comment. Could you kindly please uh, put it up for discussion, Gregory? That would be great. Uh, could you kindly say it out, what you said, what you've written there? Uh, probably not. Maybe so. I will uh, read it out. Avoiding the complications of the quark masses by showing where the Coide formula comes from might gain more attention. Yeah, Gregory, you are there. Kindly go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. So, he, there are plenty of numerical patterns like this, but the Coide one among the leptons seems suspiciously accurate. Yeah, I'm very fond of the Coire formula. Ashutosh, if you look, the th thought about this, do you know about this Coire ratio? Yeah, so the, 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 this is the following observation. If you take the masses of the electron, the muon and the tau lepton, add them up, divide it by the following quantity, Sum of the square root of the individual masses, root m1 plus root m2 plus root m3, whole squared. m1 plus m2 plus m3 divided by root m1 plus root m2 plus root m3, this whole squared. The answer is uh, two thirds to a very close approximation. You can see that in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and the, the question is why? <laughs> Why nature do this? And actually, I have an answer. I will not advertise it here. I agree with Gregory that explaining this would be interesting, but I don't know if this is of interest to the experimentalist. I'm quite happy with what my equations have to say about the Poirier formula. Can actually so, just. Here's what an experimentalist generally thinks like. Uh, yes. You say, suppose you say the prediction is exactly two thirds. Right? Uh, the experimental numbers come out to be 10 to the minus four different from two thirds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then the experiment is, ah, but the measured values of the tau lepton mass, for example, yeah. has some uncertainty. Yes. So now we want to know if that 10 to the minus four difference is just the error on the measurement. So we should go measure the tau mass to another decimal place. No, actually, yes. So the, actually, I, I, can, I understand from theory why it cannot be exactly two by three. It will depart. So the experimental value is departing from two thirds in whatever, some fifth decimal place, sixth decimal place. And I can argue for that. So my, my answer was that if the neutrino was a Dirac neutrino, the answer would have been exactly two by three. But in my work, the neutrino is a Majorana neutrino and the answer will then depart from two by three in a way consistent with uh, what is seen. But anyway, I think this is a separate long discussion. We come back to the other participants, I read out Gregory's comment, there are many of these such numerical coincidences and the renormalization issues are not trivial. Okay. I, 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 exactly on that point, Ajinder, can I ask you, because I remember this in your colloquium too. When you do these calculations, at some point it becomes QFT, right? You say QFT merges. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah. if you if you venture some energy scale or whatever the right thing is, concept is, at which it is pre-emergent and then eventually it becomes emergent. Yes. Then from where the tau mass, let's pick the tau mass. You pick the tau mass from where I am, I'm allowed to do QFT renormalization up to the transition where the emergence happens. Beyond that, I cannot do QFT. So when you make this prediction, it's happening 
at which energy scale from which I have to evolve somehow through known physics or unknown physics down to one GV and then observed and calculated have to be linked. I, I agree. I very, this is, so I call this the so-called free limit, which is the octonionic analog of Minkowski space-time. Okay. So the in which the electron becomes free, that is one energy. And the energy at which the quarks become free, that's a different energy. That's okay. But I will take the free limit of the quark masses and the free limit of the electron masses and then compare. And of course, this will run. This will run with energy. It because renormalization questions will come up. I don't know right now how to do that. Uh, this is related to your earlier question about can we calculate uh, things like G minus two or departure from it. We need to develop that formalism, which is not easy. It might take well, quite some time before we can answer the running of coupling constants and compare it with the running in QFT. We are not, uh, we are nowhere near there. Even if you can't do the running, I think in your colloquium you made a statement that in your way of looking at it, there is no 10 to the 19th GV Planck scale. There, yeah. there is a much different, much lower energy scale. What yeah. is that much lower number? Is it? My, my, my claim is if my work is correct, it may not be correct. If it is correct, the electroweak symmetry breaking scale is where the Planck scale should be getting reset to wherever that is, you know, close to a TV or, yeah. The so picture then, then unless we are really unlucky somehow, the LHC is the right machine. Yes, yes, yes. So that's where I should think of what predictions to propose, which can be looked for. So one thing is there, for example, that there is definitely a second Higgs and it is charged but in our previous conversation, you said to me, I have to tell more. So but I don't know, like what is the mass, for example? I have no clue what is the mass for this charge Higgs. So. That's okay. Don't have to tell us the mass. You can tell us the decay. Mm -hmm. Then we know the final states. Okay, okay, okay. If yeah. you tell us the charge Higgs decays to uh, W and a Z boson or decays to a top bottom quark. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That will be okay. enough. That will be enough. Okay. I, I definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. I think yeah, there's a question from Hillary. She said it's for me. I'll read out the question. What about that Z0 boson, which has a mass of about 90 GV? Must that be a composite particle if only charged particles can have mass? Yeah, good question. I should clarify. I meant that for fermions, not for bosons. Uh, so just to clarify, a Z0 to my understanding is a fundamental particle, not a composite. So Tejinder, then what does Higgs mechanism, what's the role of Higgs mechanism in your way? Or, you know, yeah, yeah. You? Is there no Higgs mechanism at all? There, there is, there is, there is. Uh, the, to my understanding, uh, at the electroweak scale, it is the same thing as a quantum to classical transition. Before that, the universe is in a unified phase where all the forces are unified, just above the electroweak scale. At the electroweak scale, there is a separation of gravity from the standard model precipitated by a quantum to classical transition from a dissiter like phase to the kind of universe that we begin to see, namely structures form on a background space time. And they're really, I wouldn't be talking of a pre existing Higgs, but the Higgs is emergent at the electroweak symmetry breaking itself as a composite of the very fermions to which it is said to give mass. And the Higgs to fermion Yukawa couplings are there in the theory, but you know, I, it's, they have not been studied with any great care. And what we call giving masses 
for me it is actually the masses are already there in planck units but the scaling the digital like expansion has washed down that scaling to these very the higgs mass comes down because of the digital expansion and i would like to say just as there is a higgs mechanism which give masses to fermions there is a parallel higgs mechanism which gives electric charge to the right handed fermions and the standard model higgs mechanism gives mass to the left handed fermions this is my picture i'm not saying it's correct but this is what the theory is saying uh, yeah but sorry you okay please go ahead actually just one last thing <laughs> Yes, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, before I lose my thought here. The, the weakness, apparent weakness of gravity by 10 to the 40, the obvious question, is yes. still understandable even though it's a TV scale emergence. Yes, uh, so yes, well, how did that come about? Okay, so that is coming about because uh, so actually here, nothing happens to gravity, but something is happening to the weak interaction because the thing is acquiring a mass. So it, the weak interaction is becoming stronger than gravity by whatever, 40 or whatever number of magnitudes. Okay. To begin with, gravity and the electroweak were the same force, but the Digital expansion, one can argue, uh, if it is by something like this 20 orders of magnitude, the mass scale is changed from 10 to the 19 GV to around 100, not 20, 17. It is this scaling down of the Higgs mass which makes the weak and electric force stronger than gravity. And these are still heuristic kind of arguments. But there is some, there is a picture. Now this effect is actually cosmological. We don't, we don't want to explain this huge uh, naturalness issue of why the Higgs so much lighter than Planck. It's not a particle physics question in this theory. It's a question for cosmology. The Dissiter expansion uh, scales down, uh, rather scales, uh, makes the weak force uh, stronger compared to gravity. And QCD as well. And QCD as well, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, but please go ahead. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, it's just, you don't need to apologize, it was important. Uh, I just tried to, to understand your model. So the vector bosons are not composite. Massive fermions are composite and the Higgs boson is composite. No, massive fermions are not composite. Only the Higgs is composite. Only the Higgs. Okay. Uh, only the Higgs. Okay. Thank you. Only the Higgs. So, so gauge symmetry is still a valid. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think I answered Hillary's question. What I'm saying is the Higgs being a scalar of spin zero is what I'm intending to be composite not the fermions, nor the Z0. I'm sorry if I caused confusion. I'm really sorry. Oh, it's only because the Higgs is spin zero. It sounds very perplexing. Spin one and spin half is okay. Uh, did you share a paper, Ashutosh? This is, no. I just clicked on Gregory trailing um, send. Yeah, the, the mass ratio of from the fine set. Oh, okay, I should see this paper. I don't know this paper. I don't know what is the compensation approach. Okay, you can see it in the Skype chat, so you can. Yeah, 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 yes, I'll come back to it. Yeah. Burnt, anything more? The lower hand, yeah, so. Uh, so great. Oh, no, I just forgot to. Uh... Yeah, Gregory not raise my hand any longer. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Okay. Also, uh, one last thing, Ashutosh, I wanted to comment on is the dark matter question: modified Newtonian dynamics versus dark matter. It seems to me, I think there's a little bit of sociological issue that we keep saying Mond has this problem, 
and that problem. What we find in whatever little I've studied is that on galactic scales, MON does very well. And in their various observations in which it points out to a fundamental acceleration scale around 10 to the minus eight centimeters per second square, for accelerations smaller than this, we see a violation of Kepler's law, Newton's law of gravitation. And that is where we suggest that perhaps there is dark matter. To my understanding, it's not very easy for dark matter and baryonic feedback to generate this fundamental scale A0 of acceleration, which happens also to be of the same order as the currently observed cosmic acceleration. So on the other hand, it is true that on cosmic microwave background and isotropy structure formation and gravitational lensing, dark matter definitely does better, but MON should not be used on those scales. It's a non-relativistic theory. People are working to look for a relativistic MON and check whether it can mimic dark matter. So my greatest worry about the dark matter graph experimental detection you showed, it's very hard to see where the standard model is going to generalize to produce a WIMP. At least in my work, it seems that the only place for new fermions is three sterile neutrinos. I, I have, don't see a place for a GV scale of imp. I mean, of course, it is found, and my theory is completely wrong. On the other hand, we found a fifth force, what I call Ewan graph, which has this very interesting property that it is sourced by square root of mass, not by mass, but by square root of mass, which is precisely what MOND is. In MOND, the MOND acceleration is proportional to the square root of the mass of the object, not to the mass. And this is never really emphasized, but for me, it was quite interesting. So we are at the moment looking into whether this fifth force has dark matter-like properties on CMB and uh, cosmic scales. So th the bosons corresponding to UN graph could be called a new dark matter report. That's correct. But a fermionic WIMP of GV mass scale, I don't see it in the standard model and beyond kind of physics. I mean, unless the supersymmetry had been there, uh, there is uh, Axion, there is also a lot of, uh, there's at least a few papers saying what is the problem with, uh, uh, with Axion. I'm not an expert, but it is, I think, a current hot favorite, probably because there's no other favorite around at the moment. But uh, I was also wanting to say that MON gets more criticism, in my opinion, than uh, it deserves. I would say the back question is open. Dark matter or MON for me right now is a uh, dark matter or modified gravity, dark matter or modified gravity. Okay, okay. Thank you. So yeah, there are two comments. Uh, Ah, yes, the burnt is saying, why is there made such a sharp distinction between dark matter and modified gravity? It could be both. Modified gravity and new particles that act only gravitationally. This sharp distinction people make may be blocking road to progress. Singh's model has sterile neutrinos and Mondia, I sort of agree. A friend pointed out to me, even if it's a fifth force, and it's modified gravity. The bosonic quanta of this force constitute dark matter, new particle. That, uh, yes, that I would agree with. I think the question is whether dark matter can be fermionic, and that is where I, I personally have uh, difficulty. Hmm. Thank you, thank you for listening. More questions, please. Quickly before I'll sneak it in. So I think Anthony was saying earlier, right, that KEV neutrino is 
when I well, I think of it as light, but actually KV neutrino means heavy enough to be non-relativistic and cold dark matter. Yes. yes. So uh, while it's very light and light enough certainly to show up yes. in some kind of oscillation experiments at Fermilab yes. or something. Right. Sterile neutrinos, uh, it's okay. I, I would be okay with them. Yeah, uh, sterile. If they are to be counted as WIMPs, I think yeah, that is that is okay for me, yes. And you notice KV is so far below on this x-axis that the recoil will be extremely small. And so we don't have detection technologies for KV neutrinos. Yes, I... I, I oscillation I, is the only way to, to see them. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, we are doing... We have actually, yeah, we have done well. We have used our two hours. So any more thoughts, Ashutosh? Uh, I think you guys, um, something happening at the TV scale is already very exciting. Yes. yes. Big storm factor, very exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sterile so, showing up in oscillation experiments, we just need to know mixing or whatever probability and the oscillation length. In other words, yes. at what energy is the oscillation length a physical distance at which we can design a detector? Yes, delta m squared by e in the, the my language, yes. In that yes. language, yes. 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 So these are the few only few things you really need. Charged Higgs, what does it decay to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All this is enough to get going on, as you say, getting experimentalists to. Yeah, thank you. This is a very valuable discussion, very enlightening for me. So, one last thing was you know, for testing Higgs with its composite, a naive outsider views you just bombard the Higgs even with each other, or you know, like the Rutherford kind of experiment, penetrate the Higgs to see its internal structure. So what does that translate to you? Why is it so difficult to test that? So two statements. One is, if you agree that what we call longitudinal vector bosons are really Higgs goldstones, mm -hmm. then that process of getting two of them to collide and watching something come out is already being studied at the LHC for 10 years and will be studied even more carefully in the next 15 years. Okay. But uh, with that, you can already say, say it's not a composite? That process is a weakly coupled process because you've got to radiate weak bosons first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is the rub of the matter, right? You have to radiate two of them. So whatever alpha weak is, you have to square that. So this makes the rate very small. Okay, okay. That's all it is. Rate small means more luminosity. Yes. So we haven't had the luminosity in the last 10 years that we are going to have in the next 10 years. Okay, okay. So this is a waiting game, this luminosity. The LHC will collect 20 times more luminosity than what we've got. So this particular Higgs bombarding thing, the Goldstone bombarding thing, is one of the prime motivators for more data at the LHC. Okay. So it's very well, it's called vector boson scattering. Yes. But as soon as you go to the longitudinal vector boson scattering, it's really just Higgs scattering. So it's exactly what you're saying. Right. So give us time. That's all we have in the books. But charge X and so on is, is being looked for. So uh, just need, I think all the decay modes are being searched for. So mm -hmm. you say that there's an unusual decay mode that we aren't looking for. That suddenly becomes very interesting. Okay. Okay. I, I get the point. Yes. Yes. Thank you.
I'll say one last thing on the G minus two since you asked. There is a nature paper, and many people have done the calculation, but these people wrote it down. When the fine structure constant, renormalized fine structure constant is adjusted because of the new lattice input, that the measured G minus two discrepancy goes down. It feels like a sad thing, right? Mm. Well, it so happens that this at the same time, the measured discrepancy in the W mass goes up. There's no way around this. This, this is demonstrated. There's no way around this. I see. Uh, in other yes. words, it's an interesting coincidence or not a coincidence, whatever, that if you change that alpha, mm -hmm. you can either increase the G minus two discrepancy in one way and reduce the W mass discrepancy or the other way. Right. So in yes. that sense, if you combine G minus two and what I think is the right W mass as measured, this alpha adjustment doesn't eliminate the consensus or the decision or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then there is a discrepancy. Very interesting, yes. And you also mentioned in your one of your slides that the two HDM models are one possible explanation for the mass. So if in my work, I'm seeing uh, two Higgs, including a charge Higgs, I should try to may use that to make a statement about W boson mass, yes. Please. Yeah, go ahead, we'll see. Yes. You might, you might be able to predict a number, right? In principle, yes, just get it. Yes, yes. In principle. I think uh, particle physicists with more expertise than me in the subject, if they could start looking into this direction of octonions, it would really help those of us who are, you know, more hardcore theorists. Phenomenologists uh, would do better than a theorist like me in answering the kind of good quest proposals you have raised. I'll try, but I think uh, those, <laughs> those, those who do this more regularly can uh, get onto it much faster. I think you should at least write down a one page paper soon on the neutrino not needing a mass in order to oscillate because it's not QFT. I, yes, so that, that's a good point. I definitely keep that in mind. A question for you from Gregory. Any recent experimental estimates on the lower bounds of what the masses of a hypothetical fourth generation might be? Very interesting, yes. Oh, hypothetical fourth generation fermions. Mm -hmm. The question about their possible masses. I have seen vector-like fermions. So most of the stuff now talks about vector-like fermions. Fourth generation vector-like fermions. Roughly speaking, I remember there's so many plots on the LHC. Uh, limits are limits are TV scale limits. So thousand GV for vector like colored fermions. So vector like quarks. Because they're strongly coupled, so gluon induced, you get lots of gluon induced stuff at the LHC. So maybe TV or even more. I might even be approaching two TV. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, Yes. Electro weak is much less, hundreds of GV. So whatever it means, vector like, uh, I, th I think for, for electro weak, it doesn't have to be electro -like. it could still be chiral. Mm -hmm. But then you might say the standard model falls apart if you don't have chiral fermions in both leptons and quarks. So, so if you have to have those together, then that's a theoretical okay. argument. But okay. weakly interacting, charged fermions or something like this, the limits are hundreds of GV. They're not at a TV. Mm -hmm. 
I just wanted to add that if a fourth fermion generation is found, the oxonions are out in my huh. very, very uh, strongly predict three fermion generations to my understanding. And that is why I'm also skeptical about this WIMP uh, of GV scales. So, I mean, if they are found again, I think the octoneon picture would be in trouble uh, to my understanding. I see. But those whims don't have to be fermions, no? Uh, that is that is true. That I agree. Yes. No, it's normally the sort of big pictures made out to be that that's fermionic, but I agree, yes. It doesn't have to be so, yeah. Okay, so maybe we could wind up now. Ashutosh, thanks so much for engaging yeah. us. It was absolutely wonderful. Very good. Thanks so much. I'll be listening into the next one. Yeah, so next week, we are meeting a week from now for Henrik Ulbricht's talk on experimental tests of quantum mechanics for large systems. That That's should be very Exactly right, yes. And can I also thank uh, Ashtosh for an absolutely fascinating talk and a, a very good and very deep going, you know, far ranging discussion. I think this has been one of our most exciting sessions so far. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Also... Thanks for accommodating my off week request. <laughs> yeah, that was a pleasure. Thank you again. Okay. We'll try and have this up within the next few days. Okay. Great. So see you all next Friday. So I'll take leave now. Bye-bye, everybody.